Please take your Bibles and go to James chapter 3, if you would, please. James chapter 3. As you know, we, through this series, have entitled uh, each message, Living for Jesus. And then with each passage of Scripture that we've approached through these uh, studies, through these, these weeks, uh, we have added the emphasis of that particular uh, passage of Scripture. And this morning, we're living for Jesus and it takes words. Living for Jesus takes words. Of course, we want to look at the entire chapter of James chapter 3. And I'll begin by reading, beginning in verse 1 down to the end of the chapter. The Bible here says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue... Can no man tame? It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. When working at the Indiana State Prison, there were many times where I saw the value and the importance and power of words. One particular event happened as I was in E-Dorm. And as you know, we had 110 men on one side and we had a day room and 110 men on the other. And making the rounds, I got into a conversation with one of the inmates, and as we were talking, uh, some other guys who were overhearing the conversation began to say to this inmate, uh, are you going to let that officer talk to you that way? And they began to chime in, and at first this other guy and I, we were having a decent conversation. Things were going well. And then, of course, it escalated because of all the input from other sources, uh, pride got in this guy's way, and we had issues that we had to contend with from that time on. But at the same time, I saw the value and the importance and the power of the right kind of words. I also know as a pastor, I am always astounded as I preach the Word of God and how God works in minds and hearts. Through the years, how pastors have influenced my life, how that I could be sitting in a church service and even sometimes the preacher is preaching on something that is not directly speaking to me, but yet God, through the Holy Spirit, is speaking to me in that service 
at that particular time and a decision is being made. And I marvel at the power of words. I'm thinking too about how you might see a man and a woman who are deeply in love with one another and how that they might express their love and care for one another with words and how powerful those words are. And here as we look at the scriptures in this entire chapter, these 18 verses, we have really for us the, the illustration as well as the powerful truth of how critical words are. Words are important. God has chosen to use words to mankind. He's given us his word, the Bible. In Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6, the scripture says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. In John chapter 6 and verse 66 and following, it says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. I've outlined this chapter this way, the personal responsibility of the tongue in verses 1 and 2, and the power of the tongue in verses 3 to 7, the problem of the tongue, verses 8 to 12, and the pictorial condition of the tongue in verses 13 to 18. And here we have laid out for us in verses 1 and 2 the personal responsibility that's ours in regards to the proper use of our tongues. Once again, it says, my brethren, so we need to keep reminding ourselves that the truths that are being emphasized here are not directed to the unsaved, but to the believer. And of course, we know that this is a Jewish-oriented book as we look at the general epistles and we see that this happened because of the dispersal when persecution came to the church there in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 8, the Christians were scattered throughout the then-known world. And so they went everywhere, the Bible says, preaching the gospel. And so James is given to help Christians live out their faith even in the midst of intense persecution and trouble and trials. And so we see here how critical it is for us to understand that this is not written to the unsaved, but to us. So this is a problem that we have. This problem here with our tongues. Every single one of us. The Bible clearly says in this passage of Scripture that the tongue cannot be tamed. Pretty stark words for us. And so I see here, it says, my brethren, be not many masters. And isn't that what the world is always looking to be, the top dog, so to speak? To be number one, to sit in the president's chair, so to speak. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. And it's not talking about, uh, condemnation is not talking about hell. It's talking simply about judgment. We're going to be held to a higher standard as believers. And it says here, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. It says here, and, the, the, and able also to bridle the whole body. The definition of responsibility is something that is your job or duty to deal with. It means to be in a position of authority over someone and to have a duty to make certain that particular things are done. And so here we have in these verses of Scripture, in these first two words where, once again, it says, my brethren, we have a special challenge that's been given to us. And that challenge carries with it a responsibility given to every believer by God. Sometimes we find ourselves complaining about the language of the unsaved and we don't pay enough attention to the language that we use. I remember as I had the privilege of going to a Christian school just two uh, years as I was in, uh, in, in grade school and high school. Uh, grade eight, we lived in Wilmington, North Carolina, 
and I was able to go to a Christian school there. Otherwise, I went to a military public school. And then we, uh, in grade 12, there in Murfreesboro, I was able to go to Franklin Road Christian School. But until that time, as I was in the public school, I remember going to Riverdale High School there in Murfreesboro, and uh, the Christians would all gather together. We had a block system set up, and so we always tried to hang out together and, and just encourage each other. Some of us were from different Baptist churches there in the area and so on. We formed a Bible club, and we tried to eat lunch together and so on. And uh, I can remember that we were really cognizant of the fact as we were in school that we wanted to make sure that we kept a good testimony. So not only did we make sure that we were careful in the way we uh, did activities, but also we wanted to make sure that our mouths were uh, in check, uh, that we were using our speech properly, that we weren't using foul language and telling off-color jokes and so on. But there was something that took place after grade 11 and going into grade 12. Of course, now I'm in a Christian school. There were five in my uh, senior class that year as they had just started the Christian school. And, and uh, in grade 12, they had actually started at uh, K4 till grade 7. And then every year they added a grade. And then the last year they had grade 11 and then we went ahead and our parents talked them into going ahead and starting grade 12. And so uh, five of us were able to be in that senior class, the first senior class. And as we were there and we were hanging out together, and of course everybody there is a professing Christian, I noticed there that there was a, there was a relaxed atmosphere in regards to how we conducted ourselves. Uh, you know, you could be a little bit on edge with the way you would talk and, you know, it would be considered a little bit cute. We'd laugh and, you know, cut up and stuff like that. And uh, we weren't really careful. The things that we began to do and use our mouths <laughs> in our speech, uh, we wouldn't dream of doing that when we were in the public school because of our testimony. But since we were all Christians in the Christian school, it didn't really matter because we were all going to heaven anyway. And we had to actually come to the conclusion, several of us, that, hey, we need to, we need to zip it up and we need to sharpen up and we need to be careful even in this setting to make sure that we spoke right. But it's very easy for us to get very relaxed in our settings. And here I th find it interesting that James is trying to tell all believers here that we need to be careful. And especially those who consider themselves to be leaders. A master is one who has authority. There's within all of us, I believe, the desire to be able to control. And God is letting us know that being an authority carries a heavy responsibility. I've said this many times, that God will hold me as pastor to a stricter standard of holiness and leadership than he will you. He, because even if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, that give the qualifications of a pastor, and you go to Titus chapter 1, he lists some things that don't apply to everyone in the congregation because he says, if you're going to be a leader in the church of Jesus Christ, then this is what you need to abide by. And so I'm going to be held to a higher standard, a stricter measuring stick, so to speak, on how this church operates than you will. God's going to hold me responsible. That's why a pastor's responsibility is called there. One of the aspects is the bishop. A bishop is an overseer. Doesn't mean that I'm the boss. Jesus Christ is the boss. But yet, all in all, as decisions are made in the direction for church is given, then God is going to hold the leadership responsible to a higher degree than anyone else. That's why you need to pray for your pastors. You need to pray for us. And Paul was constantly uh, begging people for uh, their prayers on his behalf that, because he was a spokesman and a door of utterance was given to him. And he wanted to make sure that he handled that sacred trust uh, properly. 
And so once again, as he's talking here, we need to understand he's talking to general Christianity. And so we need to understand we have a responsibility as Christians to make sure that we use our words properly, that we're careful in the way that we express ourselves. In those moments of frustration, in those moments of, sad to say, anger, uh, no matter where we are, uh, people are listening, and we need to be aware of that. And that means in the home, that means in every area of responsibility that we might have. Uh, you as a dad, you carry a, a heavy responsibility in the leadership of your home. And so the words that you use are so important in the way you talk to your wife, the way you talk to your children. And that goes for every family member. We have to be extremely careful because we're going to be held to a high standard because we have Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We say that our lives are different. And, well, if you're truly born again, the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so we say that we have a new heart. We've got a new destination. And we need to understand that we need to be Holy Spirit controlled and filled so that we might use our mouths right. We're imperfect creatures, are we not? It says so in verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body and in the subsequent verses, we're really brought to the knowledge that we are not perfect. We are not fully mature. We have problems. God's still working on us. We have issues. Uh, we are being daily conformed to the image of Christ, but we've not arrived yet. Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended. And so here he says that if you were perfect, you'd be able to bridle the whole body. Then it goes on and says, but you can't. And so we will have the tendency, if not careful, to offend one another. Offend not only the world, but one another in the church. How many times people take offense because something is said, maybe in haste? Maybe there's a disagreement and words are exchanged that maybe you haven't been careful about and someone gets offended. Sometimes it's just a, a slight, seeming a slight, or maybe it's the tone of the voice that's used. And you and I need to be careful as believers, because if we're not careful, we will offend one another. We see here the power of the tongue mentioned here in verses 3 to 7. And James illustrates and gives us several snapshots here of just how vital this little member of our body is and how dangerous it is. And he says this in verse 3. He says, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. You know, horses, they vary, of course, in weight, but generally speaking, the smaller ones, a horse being about 800 to all the way up to about 1,200 pounds, unless you're talking about the big guys, but at the same time, generally a riding horse is about that. Can you imagine? Here you have a couple hundred pound man uh, getting on the back of a horse. And yet because of that bit in his mouth, you can take that massive animal and you can turn about that body. I remember years ago, we had, uh, I had the kids all uh, on the corral area out at the uh, farmyard. And uh, I had put the bridle and bit on the, the horse and I got on her and uh, then uh, what she did, she dropped her head and kicked her foot and just took that all off. And so there I was holding the, uh, the, the bridle, the reins and uh, the bridle and bit was laying on the ground and uh, she let me know right there that uh, I was not going to stay in that same uh, spot on her back. And so I got thrown off in front of the whole family. I mean, that was a real humbling thing. But you know what? It's amazing when it did not have that, that bit in its mouth, uh, how powerful 
that animal is. It's also amazing how that when it was in her mouth, how you could make her do and turn where you wanted her to go. And so that's what the Bible is trying to tell us here about the tongue. And so these Jewish folks being uh, used to uh, the, the stock animal, they would understand the illustration that's given. So in verse 4, he goes on and says these words, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. And as I was doing a little bit of uh, looking in regards to how big of a rudder it takes on a ship or a boat, they say that it takes about 2% of the total size of the big ships that have the rudder that will actually uh, control the direction of that ship. So it's a little member, it's just a little thing, but it can turn about this huge, massive ship. Just as that little bit of metal in that horse's mouth can turn about that, that powerful, uh, muscled body of a horse. He goes on to say here in verse 6, he says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth, that dirties up the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. I mentioned in my Sunday school class about a chimney sweep business, and it's amazing when you ever have a flu fire. And uh, we went into a couple places where there was this flu fire there in northwest Indiana. And uh, it would, as, as it would catch that creosote on fire in the flu, it was amazing how it would begin to suck and want that oxygen. And it would actually take the curtains off of a, uh, off of a curtain rod and pull it right into the firebox. It would rip it right off when it would begin to, to go full bore. And then it would actually take and couches and chairs that would be a, a, across the room. It would suck in, looking for that oxygen, it would suck in everything around that would be pulled into that firebox and continue that fire. And so just a little fire, and uh, it, could, it can do great damage. Uh, we know that year after year after year, uh, when Manitoba puts out the alerts about the fires up north and a few years ago, there were like 180 fires going all at one time in Manitoba, and it creates a lot of trouble and trials. And I know in Uranium City, Brother Foffenroth would talk about one year they couldn't even have camp because of all the smoke from the fires that had been taken uh, going on in uh, the northern part of uh, Saskatchewan. And so how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And let's not get hung up on the fire uh, happening in the forest. We need to understand that if there's an improper use of our mouths, it can create a lot of damage. And we need to be aware of that as believers. Not only do we hurt the unsaved from coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you say, how does that happen? Because when they hear us talk amongst ourselves improperly, then why would they want to accept Christ? We've lost our platform from which to give the gospel. And so then also, if we're not careful, that little fire will hurt our brothers and sisters in Christ and create a lot of damage that sometimes is insurmountable in some people's lives. In verse 7, we see this where it says, about every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. And uh, maybe you've been to the zoo. Maybe you've been to an aquarium. I've, I've taken the family to the aquariums at time. We were in San Diego and we went there and we've been out to Vancouver when they've had the, the, uh, uh, the shows there where they will actually have the porpoises and the killer whales and they will do their, their things. You know, they would catch balls and they would throw water and they would jump uh, over things and so on. And uh, this, these huge, massive beasts have been tamed and they'll do the bidding of the trainer. 
Uh, we were in Thailand and we took a ride on an elephant and how that those uh, trainers would be able just with a little stick, just tap the leg and get them to go down and allow a person to get up on their back and then to take a walk. And uh, we went to one place where they were rolling logs and things of that nature and doing what they were trained to do. They were tamed that way. The Bible says every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Notice though that our tongues, as I mentioned, can bring us trouble. Look at verse 5. Even so the tongue is a member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And so we can use our tongues for trouble or for great blessing. To bring encouragement. And there's more encouragement needed amongst the body of Christ today than discouragement. Discouragement and troubles and trials will happen just naturally as we seek to live for Christ. But at the same time, how about the encouragement that we need? How about our brothers and sisters in Christ that are struggling in certain areas of their life? Um, it talks about that in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, My brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So we need to understand that there are some times where we need to draw up alongside one with another and encourage one another. We see a brother or sister having a tough time. We need to give a word of encouragement. It might just be a tap on the back. It might be just an encouraging text or word. Just different ways to let them know that you're, you care, that you're concerned, and that you love them, and, and uh, you want to be an encouragement to them. And so he's writing to believers once again. So this message is for us. Uh, it's always thrilling to be able to tell uh, those outside what they ought to be doing and the way they ought to be living and the laws they ought to pass. But we've got so much work to do amongst ourselves. And then as we are becoming more and more like Christ, then our testimony would shine all the brighter. Because the Bible says a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And just as you're driving into the city and you can see the glow of Winnipeg miles and miles away, that's the way the believer as we live out our Christianity. They will be able to see the light of the glorious gospel. They'll be able to see Jesus and as they see us living right and doing right, then I say it gives us a platform, a place to be able to get on our soapbox, so to speak, and be able to present the gospel. But we need to understand that they're listening to our speech all the time. How many times possibly have you talked to somebody and as you talk and try to give them the gospel, they'll talk about some other professing Christian that didn't do things quite right that didn't talk right, and so it turned them off to anything that you might have to say. The tongue is powerful. We see the problem of the tongue here in verse 8 where it says, it cannot be tamed. That's startling for us. How many times do you say, well, I can do it. I can control it. The Bible says you can't. There's no way that you and I, in and of ourselves, can control our mouths. We, we are depraved people. Even the Apostle Paul in his saved state said that he was a wretched man. Yes, he understood the fact that he was a saint. Yes, he understood that he was on his way to heaven. But he also recognized his inability in and of himself to live the Christian life. I like what one person said, I think it was Roy Hessian that says, only one person can live the Christian life, and that's Christ. And as they sing, Christ is all I need, Christ is all I need, he's all we need, but we do need him, amen? And so the Bible says, the, the, the tongue cannot be tamed. This truth can't be ignored. We need the power of the Holy Spirit of God 
Sometimes we think, oh, that's just for preachers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's just for the missionary. That's just when I go out soul winning. That's just when I am teaching the Bible, I need to be Holy Spirit filled. But may I remind us that in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That was written to a local church. That was written to everyone in the local church. Because right after that, it begins to talk about husbands and wives, and then children, and then bosses, and employees. And then it closes out in chapter 6 about putting on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks of the devil. And if we're not careful and we don't allow the Holy Spirit of God to control that little member in our mouths, we can do great damage. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. And I'd like to go to that passage of Scripture. And you know, Colossians... The emphasis there is the preeminence of Christ. And I want to begin reading here just a few verses. We'll end up at, chat, at uh, verse 6 of Colossians chapter 4. But notice what it says here in verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. It's talking about this unsaved. Redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So once again, just to drive it home that if we're going to be effective as a church in reaching our world for Christ, we have to watch our mouths. Not just with them, but with one another. We have to be careful at how we use our speech because the world is watching. The world is watching, but they're also listening. They're listening. How many times have you been sitting in a restaurant and your antenna's been at another table. It's always interesting when I could go into a restaurant and I sit down in town and how all of a sudden I notice people are listening. <laughs> my voice, my wife says, your voice carries. Be quiet. <laughs> and my voice does carry. But it's amazing how if you're, not, you're listening, I can remember being in, I think it was in uh, uh, Chicago Airport, O'Hare, and I'm at a restaurant eating, and I was in between flights, and so I'm sitting there, and I'm by myself, and I'm hearing a couple of people talk behind me. And that was some vile conversation going on. And it was two ladies, two women. And I couldn't believe the verbiage coming out of their mouths, how vile and wicked it was. People are watching, but they're also listening. They're also listening. We see here as well, and I'll have to rush through this here, the pictorial condition of the tongue in verses 13 to 18. And I believe that James, it's interesting how he begins to even press this matter all the more. And you say, Pastor, you mean to tell me you're going to give the entire message on this Sunday morning to just this one topic on the tongue? That's what the Bible does here. Out of five chapters, it spends an entire chapter talking about the tongue. So this has to be very vital and important for each and every one of us. And he gives some negative pictures first. In verse 14 and uh, verse 16 it says, But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Now stop and think about that. Every evil work. I can think of a lot of evil works. I mean, go to Romans chapter 1 and read that chapter. Read the list of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, verses 17, 18, and 19. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? And it lists a whole gamut of them. 
every evil work because what? The tongue is not being used properly because we are not keeping through the power of the Holy Spirit that little member in check. Talks about self-promotion here, seeking position and there in ver uh, verse 14, but if you have bitter envy in, you envy brothers and sisters in Christ that may be having uh, more opportunities for service than you feel like uh, you deserve to be where they are. Why are they doing that and I'm not? Just a seemingly a little thing, and it's maybe a thing that is relegated to the inner recesses of your heart, but yet you sit there with envy in your heart, and then we ought not be conf uh, con confounded when we find that there's a lot of other junk that's more obvious going on, but it all starts in, in the heart. There's confusion in every evil work, the scripture says. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 2, I think, del deals with self-promotion all the, all the more. And well, that's one of the dangers, I think, of our North American culture is we have the tendency to lift ourselves up and praise ourselves. We have to be careful of that. The Bible says, let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. What you need to do when people praise you is pass it on to the Lord. Because without you, you're nothing. Without him, I am nothing. And it doesn't matter what position we have or how popular we may think we are. The fact of the matter is, it's only by the goodness and glory of God that we're able to do anything. Because without him, we can do nothing, and nothing is nothing. There's strife that takes place in verse 16. And strife is seeking to win people to your side. Where you say, oh, you know, this is causing clicks and, and picking sides and arguments and disagreements. And then there's the lifting up of yourself with pride and boasting about maybe something you've done. And the fact of the matter is, it's like, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, you ought to read that chapter sometime in, in your devotions. And the Lord clearly says, I'm the one that gave you power to get up in the morning, to go to sleep. I'm the one that gave you power to get wealth. I'm the one that gave you power to go out and earn a living. And you know, it could ta be taken from you just like that. Every evil work because of the tongue not being used properly. But notice, not only does he talk about the negative aspects of the tongue, but he talks about the benefits or the positive pictures of the tongue given to us in verse 17 and 18. Notice he says this, but the wisdom that is from above, that's godly wisdom, is first pure, that's without defilement, is bathed in humility, I say, and it's the accomplishments we do are for the glory of God. You know, we ought to teach our Sunday school class to the glory of God, that he could be lifted up. I ought to be doing what I'm doing this morning because Christ needs to be lifted up. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about him. And so we need to walk in the spirit of humility and understanding that it's, it's him doing the work through us and how humbling that must be to realize our own inadequacy and realize we are nothing without him. It's like Paul said, who is sufficient for these things? Our sufficiency is of God. Praise his name for that. Talks about the meekness of wisdom, it says. And then talks about the being peaceable and gentle, easy to be approached, easy to be entreated, easy to talk to, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in them that make peace. And I jump up to verse 13. Who is a wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And you know conversation, we many times in our culture have just relegated that to speech. But we are actually talking with our gestures. We talk with our body language. We talk with our eyes. Just look at two lovers as they gawk at one another. We talk in a myriad of ways. But we also talk with our tongues. And we need to be careful that we use language 
from above. God's language. Remember, our brothers and sisters in Christ are watching and listening. So is the world. And think about the children in our church. They're watching. They're listening. We carry a lot of power with our tongues. My brethren, seek not to be many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. One day we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. That's the judgment of believers. Not whether we go to heaven or hell, but the aspect of pleasing Christ and receiving reward. And we're going to have to give an account on how we used our mouths.